By the time he was crucified, Jesus had been up about 36 hours without any sleep. We know from biblical accounts that Jesus was an early riser. There are several places in the gospel where he arose early and went and prayed. We have no reason to believe that he did anything other than that the day he had his last meal with his disciples. He likely arose early that morning and spent his day and subsequently had dinner with the disciples that night, the Last Supper in the upper room. He was then taken prisoner in the Garden of Gethsemane and was led about the old city of Jerusalem and was tried at least twice. The next day, about daybreak, he was actually hung on the cross and hung there throughout the day. Between the time he arose and the time he actually died on the cross, a period of about 36 hours had passed with no sleep and no rest. Something else you may not have thought of was how far Jesus actually walked about the old city of Jerusalem. We know he was led about from the chief's priest's house to Herod's to Pilate's during the time he was being tried. And we know he was led about the old city of Jerusalem. If you add it up, he walked about two and one half miles that last night. Also, as best we can ascertain from historical accounts, Jesus carried his cross about a third of a mile before he collapsed and wasn't able to carry it anymore. These are some physical exertions that added up and place stress on a person. The next thing I want to talk about is a phenomenon called hemothidrosis. Hemothidrosis is a very rare medical phenomenon that has been reported about 12 to 14 times in world medical literature and is only seen in people who are under tremendous stress and agony. In hemothidrosis, a person actually exudes blood from every sweat gland in their body. Each sweat gland, it has a small capillary that surrounds it, and in hemothidrosis, that small capillary ruptures. As it bursts, the person actually bleeds into their sweat glands. Instead of perspiring sweat, if you will, they actually perspire blood. The Bible gives us an excellent description of this phenomenon, saying that the Lord's sweat became as drops of blood. Indeed, every pore of Jesus' body oozed and drained blood. Now, I believe that Christ was a man, just as any one of us. But at the same time, I believe that Christ was God and knew the terrible fate that lay ahead of him. He knew the job he had come to do on this earth, the mission he had to fulfill. And I believe the man part of Christ dreaded this agonizing death and torture that lay a few hours ahead of him, just as much as any of us would. We know he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, saying, Father, if it be your will, let this cup pass from me. But he submitted his will to his father's. There in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus was under as much anxiety and physical stress from an emotional standpoint that a human could experience, knowing that in a few hours he would be delivered into one of the most agonizing and brutal deaths ever recorded in history. Why didn't the Lord bleed to death if he bled out of every sweat gland of his body? If you've been to Israel, you know that this time of year you have warm days and cool nights. It was this cool night air that probably caused the Lord's damp skin covered with sweat and blood to chill, causing the capillaries to constrict and stop bleeding. The cold air causes the blood vessels to constrict and causes the blood loss to be minimal. But by the time Jesus was taken by the soldiers from the Garden of Gethsemane, he probably had a mixture of sweat and blood all over his entire body surface. I can imagine this was some sight to behold. Let's talk about the scourging. A scourging was a horrible torture that Roman citizens were forbade to be scourged. Only slaves and traitors could be scourged. It was one of the worst punishments the Romans had to inflict on a human body. Typically, the victim was stripped completely naked and tied by his wrist to a post or a wall with his back exposed. He was then whipped from the back of his arms, down to his shoulders and back, across his bare buttocks, down the back of his legs and calves, all the way down to his heels by two Roman legionnaires, one on either side, alternating blows. The historical accounts tell us that the traditional scourging consisted of 39 lashes. If you can, imagine two large, strong, burly Roman legionnaires leaving small ribbons of muscle about two inches long, hanging through the skin. One lash with this whip, one thong, would make a cut about two inches long and about three quarters of an inch deep. To put that into medical terms, that's a cut that would take about 20 stitches to close. So with one lash, one swing of the whip, a total of nine lacerations could be inflicted on the victim. Each laceration, two inches long and three quarters to one inch deep. With one blow, the Roman legionnaire could inflict enough wounds to take 180 stitches to close. If you multiply that times 39, those two Roman legionnaires inflicted enough lacerations to take about 2,000 stitches to close. 
This gives you an idea of the amount of physical trauma that was inflicted upon Jesus just from the scourging. Again, you'd ask why Jesus didn't bleed to death. And again, you have to remember that this was done in the cold of night air. The very thing that causes blood vessels and capillaries to constrict and actually cause the blood loss from this beating to be minimal. As, as I mentioned, the idea of the lead weight was to lift the skeletal muscle out. I want you to imagine having a cut on your skin with an inch of muscle pulled out through the cut, exposed to the night air. This would be similar to a stab wound or when people are stabbed with a sharp object like sticks and the muscles are pulled back through the skin. The purpose that served in the scourging was that the victim hung on the cross in the heat of the day. And birds could land on him and actually peck and pull at these pieces of muscle, just like a robin trying to pull a worm out of the ground. And frequently, how long a person actually survived on the cross during a crucifixion was determined by how severely he was scourged. Sometimes they would beat a man nearly to death before they put him on the cross, and he would only live a few hours. Most of the time, though, the scourging was intended for public humiliation and embarrassment because it was such an inhumane method of torture. We know that Jesus was beaten in the face and head as he was mocked. I can assure you with all confidence that by the time the Lord was crucified after his beatings, it's almost certain that both of his eyes were swollen shut, and no doubt his nose was pouring blood. If Jesus was tied and held and beaten in the face by these strong legionnaires, I don't think there's any doubt that his lips were tattered like paper, and some of his teeth were knocked loose or maybe even knocked out. You might ask if his jawbones were broken. Normally they would be, but not in Jesus' case, and I'll tell you why in a few minutes. During Jesus' trials and humiliation, we also know that a crown of thorns was plated and placed on his head. I'm sure some of you have been to Israel and have seen these thorns. I have not. They're about an inch and one half to two inches long, and they're as sharp as an ice pick. The custom was to take a small three or four foot long reed and slap the thorns on top of the head of the victim in order to drive the thorns into the skull. Those thorns laid upon someone's head and then tapped down with a reed were hard enough to penetrate the outer table or the outer bone of the skull. Imagine the bleeding from three or four hundred puncture wounds in the scalp and around the forehead from these thorns. Imagine the pain. So before Jesus' crucifixion even begins, his face had been beaten to a pulp. And no doubt his eyes were swollen shut. His nose is bloody. And I remind you that every pore in his skin is wept and oozed blood. Every visible surface on the good Lord Jesus, I am confident, was covered in cake with dry blood. And his back and his arms and his buttocks and the back of his legs were literally torn to shreds from the scourging. This was the shape Jesus was in before they ever gave him his cross to head out to Calvary. Now, one of the things I take issue with from agnostics who I've heard debate this, I do not think the Lord died from shock or secondary to blood loss. There's nothing that Jesus said on the cross, nothing that the description of the crucifixion in any of the Gospels that gives us an idea that Jesus was in shock before he died. And how do I know that? When someone is shot or hit by a car, um, they're not sitting up and talking to you. Their eyes are glassy, their color is pale, their blood pressure is about 60 over nothing, and they are barely conscious, if conscious at all. See, Jesus never lost consciousness. There's nothing in the description of his trials, his scourging, or his time on the cross that tells us he was incoherent mentally or lost consciousness. And something else, a physical stress. Everything in the Bible tells us about the life of Jesus is that he was a healthy, early 30s male who lived through a rough life. He didn't have a home. He probably slept outside and he walked everywhere he went. He was probably, as we would say, as tough as a pine knot. I think Jesus was uh, a hearty young man, very strong and stout physically, and that there was nothing weak or puny about him from a medical standpoint prior to the crucifixion. As far as emotional stress, I don't think Jesus had any kind of nervous breakdown. He was certainly under stress in the Garden of Gethsemane, but nothing that he said on the cross gave any indication whatsoever that he was decompensating mentally, even during his gravest hours on the cross. I've also heard cardiac arrhythmia debated at the cause of Jesus' death. And when people go into cardiac arrhythmia, if it's ventricular, technocardia, or some other type of cardiac arrhythmias, one of the first things that happens is that the heart, even though it beats fast or funny, doesn't function very well as a pump. 
when it doesn't function well as a pump, your blood pressure drops and you lose consciousness. Again, nowhere in the Gospels do we have an account where Jesus ever lost consciousness until he died. Let's, let's talk about the cross for just a minute. We know from Corinthian and Roman history that the crosses were usually in two parts. Uh, first, the crossbar, from very good historical accounts, can be estimated to have weighed 125 to 150 pounds. It had to be about the size of a cross tie. Now, many of us have stacked or used cross ties at one time or another, or have certainly seen what they look like on the railroad tracks. I want to remind you that this was a rough, unplanned, unfinished piece of wood with splinters and spikes and rough places in it, just like you would expect to see in a railroad cross tie. When the victim's final trial and condemnation had taken place, to maximize the shame and suffering, the custom was to tie the crossbar to the victim and have him carry it through the city from his point of condemnation to his point of execution. Part of the custom was that many times these people would be forced to stagger through the streets after being scourged and beaten with the crossbar tied to their arms. And to add to the ultimate humiliation, the victim had to bear the cross naked. Uh, imagine how humiliating that would be in this day and time, much less how humiliating and agonizing it must have been for Jesus. The other part of the cross was an upright part, which is just like a post in the ground. Every major city at the time had an area outside the gates where they performed crucifixions. It was really not only a form of execution, but of entertainment as well. As someone condemned to crucifixion would bear the crossbar through the streets to the point of crucifixion, and once there, would be thrown onto the ground. Nails would then be driven through their hands into the crossbar. Then two forks, something similar to pitchforks, would be placed around each end of the crossbar, and they would be boosted up, and the crossbar hung on top of the upright post. Once they were braced on the upright post, both feet would then be nailed to the foot of the piece. The nail wounds. The Romans practiced crucifixion for hundreds of years, and they perfected the art of pain and suffering. And how could a man have spikes driven through his hands and feet and not bleed to death? The Romans figured out if they drove a spike through a man's wrist right at the middle, they could avoid hitting any arteries or veins. And if you go back and look at the Hebrew word for hand, it's inclusive from the fingertips to about where your wristwatch crosses your wrist. So the hand didn't necessarily mean the palm. You cannot drive a spike through a man's palm and hang him by it without pulling right out between his fingers. It's an acceptable medical fact that the muscle in your palm is not strong enough to support your body weight. In order to be able to drive spikes through the Lord's hands, they had to drive them through at the wrist. There, there's a strong ligament called the traverse carpal ligament that is strong enough to support the body weight. The Romans figured out that if they came about where the crease in the wrist is and drove the spike through this area, they would miss the radio artery. It's the artery people cut when they try to kill themselves by cutting their wrist, right where the doctor would take your pulse. And they would also miss what is called the ulnar artery over the little finger side. And what they would do, though, is drive the nail right through the biggest nerve in the hand, called the median nerve. If any of you ever had carpal tunnel syndrome, I have, you know how uncomfortable any inflammation and irritation to that medium nerve can be. When the median nerve is transected, it gives about the sensation of having an electrical kettle prod stuck to your wrist and a constant electrical shock going through your hand and it causes the fingers to claw. In essence, the Romans devised a way they could drive a spike through a man's hand and not lose one drop of blood, while maximizing the amount of pain and suffering that a man could endure. The Romans did the same thing with the feet. They calculated where they could drive a spike through both a man's feet and not cause blood loss that would cause a victim to bleed to death. The spike would have been placed between the first and second metatarsal bones and missing the dorsal artery. There again, they drove the spike through the feet with no blood loss. The spike misses the artery, but does hit the plantar nerves, thereby causing the same horrible shock sensation. Let's talk now about Jesus hanging on the cross. When hanging by their arms as a crucifixion victim's body weight sags down, their diaphragm functions like billows. As the diaphragm drops into the abdomen, it pulls in air. So someone hanging on the cross had no difficulty whatsoever pulling air into their lungs. See, the tough part for people hanging on the cross was breathing out. In order for a crucifixion victim to exhale, they would have to pull up against the spikes with their hands and push up against the spikes with their feet. And I want to remind you, 
Here's Jesus hanging on the cross, probably naked, in front of the whole city of Jerusalem. And I've already described his back to you. See, every time he took a breath, that tattered, lacerated, and riddled back was drugged and scraped across the splinters and the rough knobs and spikes protruding from the cross. Each time he breathed out, each time he uttered a word, he would have to pull up with his arms and push up with his legs. And that's why I want to remind you just how precious Jesus' words from the cross were. That's why he couldn't say more than three or four words at a time. Because when you talk, you only talk as you breathe out, not as you breathe in. See, every word Jesus spoke on the cross was spoken as he was pulling up against the nails and dragging his back against the cross. That's why what the Lord tells us, what he spoke from the cross, is very precious to me. Because I know what it cost him and how badly it hurt him. Every time I think about this, it reminds me how he died for us and just how every word hurt and how he suffered just to give us every word. What did he say? He said, behold your son. And then he said, behold your mother. See, Jesus knew he had just about finished his job and done everything that he had come to do in this world. Uh, Finally, when he had done all of that, he said, it is finished. And when he said it is finished... That's the last time he pulled up with his hands and pushed up with his feet, dragging his back across the cross as he hung there naked before the city of Jerusalem in total shame and humiliation, convicted and tortured and condemned for something of which he was not guilty. If you go back and look at historical accounts, you find that people actually lived on the cross, crucified for up to six days. And if you can, imagine a man hanging on a cross outside the gates of a city with the birds pecking at his eyes and roosting on his head. As he hangs there naked is the spectacle for the whole city. That was the point of this. It was part of the shame and humiliation that a man hanged there so people could come by for a day or two and stand and mock and jeer and shout accusations and railings and blasphemy at him. The idea was to make him suffer as much as possible. Crucifixion was never intended to kill anybody. It was only intended to make a human being suffer as much as he can be afflicted upon before killing him by breaking his legs. But I don't believe Jesus died from crucifracture or from exhaustion asphyxia either. Uh, Crucifracture is what they would do when they simply grew tired of watching this agony and suffering or when they had something better to do and wanted to end the crucifixion. They would take a spear and swing it like a ball and bat and hit the victim in the shins to break his shin bones. They'd break the tibula and then the fibula bone. Many times they would have to beat the legs for five or ten minutes until they finally could break the shin bones. It takes a lot of force to break your shin bones. With the shin bone broken, the victim could no longer push up to breathe. Why didn't they break Jesus' legs? If you go back to Psalms, I believe 34th chapter, it says not a bone of his body was broken. This is why Jesus' nose and jaws and cheekbones should have been broken, but couldn't have been. The 34th chapter of Psalms wouldn't let that take place. And that's why the Roman centurion didn't break his legs, because the Bible says not a bone of his body was broken. And that was totally uncharacteristic of the crucifixion because that's how crucifixion victims died. When they grew tired of you and got bored with the situation, they'd break your legs in about four to six minutes and you'd smother to death because you could no longer push up with your legs. You laid there sagging, unable to breathe out and you were asphyxiated in about four to six minutes. That's how the two thieves died, but Jesus was dead already. Let's go back to the 19th chapter of John and what happened. Uh, What did they do when they went to the first thief? The Roman centurion broke his legs. What did he do when he went to the second thief? He broke his legs. But when the centurion went to Jesus, the Bible says he was dead already. Now, why would a young, strapping, healthy man be dead after being on the cross for six hours? There's absolutely no medical explanation for it at all. And excuse my interpretation here, but the Lord had no business being dead. He should have been alive just like the other two. He wasn't beaten to the point of death. His blood loss was minimal, and we know he wasn't in shock because everything he told us from the cross made sense. He identified his mother standing at some distance from the foot of the cross. He was able to see enough to identify her and to identify one of the disciples, and everything he said was coherent. He was not out of his mind, and he was not having a nervous breakdown, and he wasn't even in shock from blood loss. The Lord was perfectly coherent and sane up until the moment he died. 
the spear wound to the Lord's side was not the cause of death either. When the centurion saw that Jesus was dead already, he thrust the spear into Jesus' side. The Bible says in Zechariah that they may look upon him who they pierced. The spear thrust was biblical prophecy fulfilled. That was one of the reasons why Jesus was already dead. See, God had a plan. We were to look upon the one they had pierced. Zechariah had to be fulfilled. Roman centurions were trained killers. They were taught how to deliver death blows that would take a man's life in a matter of seconds. A person could take a 22 through the left side of the heart and likely walk in the hospital sitting up and talking. However, if you're stabbed or shot on the right side of the heart, where the inferior and superior vena cava are emptied into the right side of the heart, you're unconscious and pretty close to dead in about 20 or 30 seconds. This bloated Jesus was no doubt delivered from the right side through the right lung into the heart and into the spine. It would have penetrated somewhere between the 7th and 8th intercostal space, probably on the right. But the Bible says that blood and water came out of Jesus' side after the spear was thrust in. Now, if you take a unit of blood, drain it out of a human being's body, and put it in a quart jar and set it on top of a desk, in about 30 minutes, the red blood cells begin to settle out and the plasma rises to the top. The plasma separates from the red blood cells. So when the soldier thrust the spear into the Lord's side, Jesus had already been dead for 30 or 45 minutes. Maybe you've never thought about that. The spear wound did not take the life of the Lord Jesus. He was dead already when they thrust the spear into his side. So let me conjecture a little bit about what I think. I think there's a very good description of the crucifixion in the Bible. And there's very good medical evidence that can be pulled out of that description that tells us that the Lord did not die in the manner that most crucifixion victims die. When the Roman centurion went to him to break his legs, he was dead already. They couldn't break his legs because the Bible said in Psalms, not a bone of his body shall be broken. Why then would the soldier thrust a spear into his side? Because Zechariah told us hundreds of years before that we'd look upon the one we'd pierced. And what came out? Blood and water. And I think there's enough medical evidence there that the Lord was dead at least a half an hour or an hour before. So what took the Lord's life? No man did. No man, no Roman centurion, no cross took Jesus' life. He was able to do something, something we've never seen another human being do. He laid down his life. And when it was finished and with a loud voice, he gave up the ghost. Jesus gave his life. The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. See, no one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. And this command I received from my father, John 10, 17, 18. I'm deeply blessed. Our Lord conquers death and gives life. Amen. My friends, through this video, I hope to reveal some things that will make us meditate on the actual suffering Jesus experienced in the last hours of his life. I tried to present my conclusions about the death of Jesus based on medical research from experienced trauma physicians and my understanding of scripture. You may or may not have thought of some of the things I have pointed out to you, but I hope, I hope I shared some things with you that will make the life and death of your Savior a little bit more precious. Yeah, I, I believe that Christ's suffering uh, and the demonstration of the kind of, um, of physiologic stress that his human body was under uh, is manifested in the Garden of Gethsemane, where it's described that he was sweating blood. And there are there is a well-documented uh, medical condition in which patients who are under tremendous amount of uh, emotional stress and physiological stress can, in fact, 
uh, sweat blood because little blood vessels within the glands burst and, the, and then the blood is expressed. The, the, the scourge involved the use of a, a short whip with pieces of uh, typically metal, sometimes bone, sometimes pieces of porcelain wrapped in these leather straps, which is then utilized to, to come across uh, typically the back, the shoulders, the legs of the victim. Uh, and uh, the first few passes across a particular body part would tear through the skin, the fat, uh, but eventually, once the outer layers were, were uh, torn away, it would start getting in the muscle and the tendon. And of course, along the way, you're ripping through all the blood vessels that supply all those tissues. And so you're losing blood the whole time. The plant that was described um, uh, actually had a very long thorn, um, not the little thorns that we would think from a rose bush. These were thorns that were uh, typically an inch and a half to two inches in length. The scalp is one of the most vascular portions of our bodies. It had a huge blood supply up there. So then having those thorns shoved down into the, you know, down onto the bony plate would have gone through all the scalp which in and of itself would have created a huge amount of blood loss. Uh, I've seen people actually bleed to death from just a scalp injury. So uh, this is not a small injury to have, uh, who knows, dozens uh, of these things shoved into your scalp. And so that would have caused more blood loss. Typically when a victim has to uh, uh, carry the cross, what has been described uh, in the literature, in, in actual Roman literature, is they, they describe, the, the, they, they carry the crossbar. Uh, and the crossbar is estimated, alone, was estimated to weigh about 110 pounds. And of course, if your arms are stuck out here, wrapped up on the cross, crossbar, and you fall down, you need help getting up. You, you, you just can't get up on your own because there's no possible way without your arms to get up. So you would have needed help getting up. If he, fall, if he fell over, there's a good chance that he could have hit his chest, which, which then could account for the possibility of a cardiac injury. Anatomically, we consider the wrists as part of the hand. And so uh, with the placement of the nails between the radius and the ulna, at that position, it, it still fits, fits the definition of being in the hand and it's in a position in which the nail won't rip out, which you have to have, you have to have a solid point of fixation. Uh, another interesting point about the placement of that is the median nerve goes right straight through that particular uh, 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 portion of the wrist. And so there would have been uh, either destruction of the nerve or, or impingement of the nerve that would have created a tremendous amount of pain so that every time you try to take a breath, you'd be, it'd be agonizing. You'd be pushing down on spiked feet which of course hurt, and then you'd be hanging on spiked arms. And so you alternate from excruciating pain to excruciating pain every time you take a breath. So, so even if he survives the actual crucifixion, he would have had to survive what I believe to be a, a, a lethal injury from the spear to, to find out whether he was alive or not. What's described is the loss of water and blood and that would entail either the, the uh, uh, either a pleural effusion or pericardial effusion, and the blood would have come from either pulmonary artery, a pulmonary vein, the aorta or vena cava, or the heart itself. None of those injuries, unless you're treated immediately by a trauma surgeon like myself, with all the advanced equipment that we have, would be survivable after even a few minutes. Christ, as the Son of God, could have survived anything. He chose to manifest himself as a human at that point in time and allowed himself to die. And, and being human at that point in time, he could not have survived this particular series of traumas. It's not possible. Um, Christ, as God, could have survived anything they threw at him. And, but he chose to be Christ, the human, at that point in time to die for our sins. And that, Given that, that self-limitation of remaining to be human, he died. He did not survive the event. Crucifixion was one of the most dreaded and painful forms of execution in ancient times.
thousands of crucifixions were performed by the Romans, the most famous, of course, being Jesus Christ. Yet, because almost all depictions of Jesus on the cross were painted centuries later, our image of the death of Christ is in many ways incorrect. Understanding Jesus' death, though gruesome and painful in nature, can help us better understand the incredible love that the Savior has for us because of what He was willing to endure. Crucifixion was often first preceded with the painful process of flogging or scourging, as is the case of Jesus. The scourging was done to physically weaken the condemned person, accentuating the already painful process of crucifixion. The whip or flagrum was made of strips of leather fastened to a handle, with broken glass, nails, bone, and lead weights fastened to the end of the strips. The flagrum was designed to rip through the flesh, tearing skin and muscle from the bone. The powerful symbol of the sacrament bread, which represents Christ's flesh, being torn apart, is an apt reminder of the scourging that Jesus endured on our behalf. Once flogged, the convicted person was made to carry his own cross through the city till they arrived at the place of execution. Unlike most depictions showing Jesus carrying an entire cross, the condemned man instead would actually only carry the cross piece. This was because of the incredible weight of a full cross, and because wood was such a scarce resource that it was common to use an already existing tree or permanent post as the base of the cross. The fact that Jesus may have been crucified on a living tree brings beauty to the title of Jesus as the tree of life. The Gospels tell us that Jesus was crucified at a place called Golgotha, from the Hebrew word meaning skull, most likely referring to a knoll or small hill, shaped like a bare skull. Today in Jerusalem, there are two main traditional locations for Golgotha, the hilltop in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre and Skull Hill, just outside the Damascus Gate. The first location was chosen by Helena, mother of Emperor Constantine, in about 325 AD because of several earlier traditions that marked this as the place. Today the hill is located within this enormous church under slabs of stone, with only portions of the original hill visible behind sheets of glass. Interestingly, it is because of this church, with its steep steps that lead up to the traditional place of crucifixion, that we so often see paintings and film depicting the crosses on top of a hill. However, Rome did not generally crucify on the top of hills away from onlookers, but instead right next to the main roads and gates of the city. Crosses were also much shorter than normally depicted, so as to bring their victims as low as possible, placing them almost at eye level with onlookers. This was so that all who passed by would vividly see the consequences of opposing Rome. The other traditional site, Skull Hill or Gordon's Calvary, was identified only about 175 years ago. It was chosen because of the hill's remarkable resemblance to a skull and because of its close proximity to an ancient tomb, now known as the Garden Tomb. It was also identified because, in the Law of Moses, animals were to be killed on the north side of the Altar of Sacrifice. With this hill being north of the temple, and in a continuation of the same mount where the temple stood, the place seemed to be an apt location for the sacrifice of the Lamb of God. In 1968, several tombs were discovered in Jerusalem, dating to the time of Jesus. Within one tomb, they found a stone ossuary, or bone box, with a nail driven through the ankle bone of the buried man. This find is extremely significant, as it is the only known archaeological find of a crucified person. Several intriguing things were learned from this discovery. First, the nail was not driven through the front of the foot, as is often depicted in Art of Jesus, but instead through the side of the ankle, directly through the bone. This means that a separate nail was driven through each foot, with the feet straddling the cross instead of in front. 
Archaeologists were also surprised to find wood fragments on both sides of the ankle bone. This has led to the conclusion that the nail was first placed through a wood washer before being driven through the foot and cross. The washer would have prevented the victim or family members from attempting to tear the body from the cross to avoid the excruciating pain of crucifixion. Hanging on the cross, the victim would be forced to stand upon these nails driven through his ankles, alternating with holding his weight up through his outstretched, nailed hands. This process was made all the more painful as the torn flesh on the back from scourging would be pressed to the cross as they alternated between hanging from their hands and standing on their feet. It was common for victims to survive for several days on the cross before dying, making Jesus' death after only a few hours very unusual. It is believed that the victim died from asphyxiation, or in other words, the lack of air, caused from the sheer exhaustion of hanging on the cross. The willingness for Jesus to die on the cross for us in such a painful and agonizing way teaches us of his incredible love. Jesus could have been killed by stoning or by one of many other ways, but he instead chose to be crucified. He submitted to the most heinous and dreaded forms of death so that he could understand and succor his people. Because of this, none of us can claim that Jesus cannot fathom our sorrows, anguish, and pains, for he has endured all things. Truly, as Isaiah so prophetically stated, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. The misconceptions regarding the Bible that we inherit from others can be so heavily ingrained in church culture that we sometimes fail to question them. For example, how many wise men visited Jesus when he was born? I'll give you a moment to think about it. The answer most commonly given is three. This answer, however, is incorrect. The only gospel to mention the wise men is Matthew and Matthew gives no particular number. So why does three seem like the right answer? Most likely because Matthew records three distinct gifts offered by the wise men. Gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. So, let me ask you another question. How did Jesus really die? You'd be right to answer crucifixion, but crucifixion was only the instrument or manner of Christ's death. What was the actual cause? To answer this, we'll take a deep dive into the historical context of the crucifixion through the eyes of a medical doctor. This is a medical examination of the cross. To start, it's important that we understand some of the historical context. This video won't address the events or reasons leading up to Christ's trial, conviction, and crucifixion, but we will take a closer look at the historical practice of Roman scourging and crucifixion. Matthew 27:26 reads, Having scourged Jesus, Pilate delivered him to be crucified. Crucifixion was prefaced by scourging, either on the way to the cross or before the victim began the trip to the cross. Tied to a post, the condemned person would be beaten with the flagellum, a leather whip with metal knotted into its thongs. This whipping bloodied the victim's back, leaving strips of flesh hanging from the wounds. In ecclesiastical history, Eusebius writes, Bystanders were struck with amazement when they saw them lacerated with scourges even to the innermost veins and arteries, so that the hidden inward parts of the body, both their bowels and their members, were exposed to view. After the grisly scourging, Christ would have had his arms outstretched and tied to a plank of wood called the patabellum. Having stretched out both of his arms and fastened them to a piece of wood which extended across his breasts and shoulders as far as his wrists, 
The Patabellum had an estimated weight of 60 pounds, 27 kilograms, and would become the horizontal piece of the cross. After fixing Christ's arms to the Patabellum, he was led up to the place of his crucifixion, Golgotha, Aramaic for the place of the skull, or in Latin, Calvary. The criminal was then thrown to the ground on his back, with his arms outstretched along the patabellum. His hands could be nailed or tied to the crossbar, but nailing, apparently, was preferred by the Romans. The archaeological remains of a crucified body, found in an ossuary near Jerusalem and dating from the time of Christ, indicate that the nails were tapered iron spikes approximately 5 to 7 inches 13 to 18 centimeters long with a square shaft of 3 eighths inch one centimeter across. The nails commonly were driven through the wrists rather than the palms. A nail through the mid palm could potentially be unstable and pull through the flesh between the fingers from the force of the victim's body weight. But a nail placed through the wrist bones, carpal bones, or above the wrist would be stable and hold the victim on the cross. After being fixed to the patabellum, Jesus would have been hoisted onto the vertical part of the cross, also known as the stripes. This is where another common misconception occurs, namely the shape of the cross. While most depictions of the cross are a lowercase t shape, also known as a crux immisa, it is far more likely that the cross of Christ was an uppercase t shape, also known as a crux comissa. Crucifixion was a frequent practice that made the more complex structure of the cross immisa impractical for routine use. Many extra-biblical sources also suggest the uppercase T-shaped cross being the standard for crucifixion. Besides an impractical structure, there was also a problem with the weight of the crux immisa. On average, a fully assembled crux immisa was 300 pounds, 136 kilograms. The idea that prisoners condemned to crucifixion would be expected to carry a cross of this weight seems highly unlikely. With reasonable certainty, Jesus was crucified on a crux comasa, a T-shaped cross, having a height of six to eight feet. Jesus would have been eye to eye with his executioners while hanging on the cross. The long vertical piece of the cross, the stripes, was permanently fixed to the ground. Soldiers lifted the patabellum with the attached victim up onto the stripes. The patabellum was held in place on top of the stripes by a mortise and tenon joint. The feet were then nailed to the stripes. Nails piercing the top of Jesus' feet may also be an artistic invention. Archaeological evidence suggests it may actually have been common practice to hammer a nail through the heel. To prolong the crucifixion process, a horizontal wooden block or plank serving as a crude seat, sedial or sedulum, often was attached midway down the stripes. Only very rarely, and probably later than the time of Christ, was an additional block, supidenium, employed for transfixion of the feet. For six hours, Jesus hung on the cross. It was often customary for Roman soldiers to break the legs of those crucified to hasten their death. But when they arrived to find Jesus, he was already dead. Since it was the day of preparation, and so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and at once there came out blood and water. There was no doubt that Jesus was dead Roman military was well known for their violence and expertise in execution. It was often the case that if a condemned prisoner escaped, or if a soldier failed to perform his duty of execution, that the soldier himself would take the place of the prisoner, giving great incentive to ensure the death of those condemned. This is evidenced in Acts 16.21. When the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. 
Since the exact moment of death by crucifixion was uncertain, executioners could ensure death by a spear thrust into the victim's side, such as was dealt to Jesus. The extent of Jesus' tortures was such that he could never have survived the crucifixion and entombment. Clearly the weight of historical and medical evidence indicates that Jesus was dead before the wound to his side was inflicted and supports the traditional view that the spear, thrust between his right ribs, probably perforated not only the right lung but also the pericardium and heart and thereby ensured his death. Accordingly, interpretations based on the assumption that Jesus did not die on the cross appear to be at odds with modern medical knowledge. With the historical context in view, we can now move on to the medical commentary on details regarding the sweating of blood, fluid deprivation, the severity of Jesus' beatings, the effects of scourging, lung injury, signs of shock, the water and blood from the spear thrust, and the actual cause of Christ's death. The night before the crucifixion, Jesus and the disciples ascended the Mount of Olives, and Jesus prayed fervently to the Father about what was about to take place. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Sweating blood, called hematidrosis in medical terminology, is a rarely observed phenomenon. It is the spontaneous discharge of blood through the skin sweating blood. The rarest form of hematidrosis is single episode psychogenic hematidrosis and is associated with the fear of death prior to execution. There are only a handful of reported cases of this kind. That Jesus sweat blood indicates he had clear understanding of the horror he was about to experience. It is interesting that only Luke, a physician, wrote about Jesus sweating blood. He must have considered it a significant detail. During times of emotional distress, sweating is increased due to the increased elevated circulating catecholamines, hormones made by the adrenal gland, in the blood. This is caused by sympathetic nervous system activation and commonly called a fight or flight response or an adrenaline rush. A high state of anxiety and sweating would contribute to dehydration. Jesus would have been without food or water for at least 12 hours prior to being placed on the cross. We can safely assume that Jesus Jesus would have been deprived of anything to eat or drink after his arrest. Symptoms of dehydration could include thirst, dry mouth, headache, dizziness, confusion, muscle cramps, and heart palpitations. Roman scourging caused blunt trauma, contusions, and lacerations all over the body. This would have caused significant blood loss from the cuts and tears in the flesh, as well as bruising from blunt trauma. Scourging and blunt trauma to the chest wall can cause injury to the lungs. In traumatic hemorrhagic shock, seemingly the case with Jesus, shock occurs from decreased circulating blood volume due to injury and bleeding. Symptoms can include confusion, lightheadedness, feeling cold or clammy, weakness, and extreme thirst. The spear would have entered Jesus' chest wall between the ribs. Pleural effusion, fluid around the lung, generally has a clear appearance and would be described as water by someone in the ancient world. When the spear ruptured the heart, blood would mix with the fluid in the chest and give the appearance of blood emanating from the chest wound. As mentioned earlier, crucifixion was only the instrument or manner of death. What was the actual cause? Could it be cardiac rupture, the spear thrust to the chest, suffocation, or was it something else entirely? Let's take a closer look at some of the most popular theories, started with what is certainly the most poetic, namely, a broken heart. Interestingly, in more recent times, it has been found that severe emotional distress can affect the heart muscle. There is a rare condition called takotsubo, stress-induced cardiomyopathy, sometimes called the broken heart syndrome. This condition occurs after extreme stress. It temporarily weakens the heart muscle and actually causes the heart to balloon or dilate. When this occurs, the heart is unable to beat properly and causes symptoms indistinguishable from a heart attack. However, Jesus does not fit the profile of patients suffering from this syndrome. 
Only 3% of those affected by Takotsubo stress-induced cardiomyopathy are under age 50, and cardiac rupture is thought to occur in less than 2% of these patients. Patients are typically over age 50, 90% are female, and those affected generally have a good prognosis for recovery in the absence of any underlying cardiac disease. The most common cause of cardiac rupture is a heart attack. In medical terms, myocardial infarction. Heart attacks occur when a clot, thrombosis, occurs in an artery providing blood to a portion of the heart muscle. A heart attack would be very unlikely in a healthy male in his early 30s. Is it possible that Jesus survived up until the last moment when a Roman soldier thrust a spear into his side? Was this wound the final blow that caused Christ's death? Some have thought that the description of blood flowing from Jesus' side indicate that he was alive at that moment. The premise being that blood does not flow from a wound in a dead body. The idea that blood cannot flow from a corpse is not necessarily true, however. A large clot, such as could develop in the heart at the moment of death, may be unstable and reliquify. Additionally, the effects of traumatic shock can impair the blood's usual clotting capacities. With a mandate that those being executed had to die before sundown, soldiers broke the legs of the others being crucified. They would not have hesitated to break Jesus' legs also. Roman soldiers were skilled in execution and assuring condemned prisoners were killed. We must therefore Therefore, conclude that Jesus was unmistakably dead, but to assure absolute certainty, a spear was thrust into his chest wall, which collapsed his lung and ruptured his heart. Perhaps the most ubiquitous theory is that of asphyxiation or suffocation. Many popular level apologetics books take this to be the case. Once a person is hanging in the vertical position, crucifixion is essentially an agonizingly slow death by asphyxiation. The nature of crucifixion virtually guarantees death from asphyxiation. While this theory is widely supported among experts, is there really enough evidence to back it up? Suffocation is the interruption of the breathing apparatus. Asphyxiation is the term given to the effects of oxygen deprivation, which potentially can lead to death. Suffocation can cause asphyxiation. Anbinden was a type of suspension torture used during the Austro-Hungarian War, where victims were suspended with their arms tied overhead with their feet unsupported. With the force of their entire body weight being supported only by arms tied directly overhead, the victim chest walls were expanded, restricting the ribs from moving normally. Regular breathing became impossible, and victims rapidly developed severe pain and muscle spasms. There are logical problems with suffocation being the mechanism of Jesus' death, however. Anbinden torture differs from crucifixion in that the arms were tied directly overhead and the feet were left dangling unsupported. In crucifixion, the arms were restrained to the side rather than directly overhead, and legs were supported by being nailed in place. Crucifixion could last for days, suggesting that breathing while on the cross was not restricted in any significant way. Jesus himself spoke with the others being crucified with him. It is counterintuitive to think that crucifixion victims could carry on a conversation if they were suffocating. Conversing during prolonged Anbinden suspension torture would be impossible. Dr. Frederick Zugabi performed an interesting reenactment experiment, placing subjects on a cross while monitoring their vital signs and blood chemistry. All subjects maintained normal arterial pH and oxygenation throughout the experiment. Subjects fastened to the cross only by their arms with their feet dangling unsupported had severe arm pain, but their breathing was unaffected. It is almost certain that crucifixion victims were not able to pull themselves up with their arms. The primary muscles flexing the arms are the biceps, biceps brachii. With the body leaning forward and the arms outstretched on the cross, the biceps muscles would be elongated and at a mechanical disadvantage. In a stretched or elongated position, the biceps muscles would also have diminished contractile capability. The notion that crucifixion victims had to push and pull themselves up on the cross to keep from suffocating finds little empiric support. 
Theories like cardiac rupture, a fatal spear thrust, or even suffocation don't seem to account for the evidence. There is, however, one more option that, upon close examination, could be our most likely candidate. Shock. In medical science, shock refers to the effects of decreased blood perfusion and oxygen delivery to cells within the body. Traumatic hemorrhagic shock is caused by decreasing circulating blood volume, hypovolemia, as a result of injury and bleeding. That Jesus suffered traumatic hemorrhagic shock is suggested by the descriptions of his torture and execution. The heart beats faster and blood vessels in the body constrict. Compensatory mechanisms by which the body seeks to maintain blood pressure and increase blood return to the heart. Extreme thirst can occur during shock as well. The human body can compensate for modest blood loss. However, shock can occur when blood loss surpasses 10%. At 45% blood volume loss, reduction in blood return to the heart and decreased resistance in the body's blood vessels will cause the blood pressure to drop to zero. There is a point beyond which blood pressure cannot fall without eventually causing death in spite of the best medical treatment. The effects of shock are many. Cardiac function can become impaired, blood vessels do not function properly, inadequate oxygen supply can cause cellular death, leading to widespread inflammation and toxic chemical effects. Acidity develops within the body. The effects of shock are many and each one serious, all the more when multiple effects occur simultaneously. Even more dangerous is the amplification of shock through a snowball effect called a positive feedback loop. That is to say, shock causes more shock. The body's first defense against bleeding is for blood to clot at the site of injury. A dangerous possible complication of shock is that blood can lose its normal ability to clot. This has become known as trauma-induced coagulopathy. It is present in one in three trauma patients admitted to emergency departments and carries a markedly increased risk of death. Trauma patients admitted to emergency departments are four times more likely to die if coagulopathy is present. Causative factors that trigger coagulopathy during trauma are tissue injury with bleeding, hypothermia, and acidemia. With diffuse injury and widespread activation, the blood clotting mechanisms, necessary blood cells, and chemical factors can be depleted and cause an imbalance between the blood's ability to clot and dissolve unnecessary clots. This is detrimental amplification of the body's natural process of dissolving unneeded blood clots just when the blood's ability to clot is needed most. That is to say, the body shifts to dissolving clots abnormally when it should be producing more clots where needed instead. Hypothermia, decreased core body temperature to 36 Celsius or below, impairs blood coagulation. In the human body, a decrease in blood temperature slows the activity of enzymes associated with blood clotting. Another inciting factor that contributes to coagulopathy is when the blood becomes acidic, cold acidemia, decreased blood pH, which makes the blood more acidic. The process leading to this is called acidosis. Like decreased temperature, acidity in the blood slows the enzyme activity associated with clotting. Trauma-induced coagulopathy is an ominous potential complication of traumatic hemorrhagic shock and markedly increases the risk of death. The greater the tissue injury and bleeding, the greater the risk. Acidemia and hypothermia are also triggering factors and common during shock. When tissue injury with bleeding, acidemia, and hypothermia occur simultaneously, they create a positive feedback loop of progressively worsening coagulopathy. This this has been called a lethal triad. Trauma-induced coagulopathy is difficult for physicians to treat in the best modern trauma centers. In Jesus' time, death would have been certain and rapid. Thirst from hemorrhagic shock is the result of decreased blood volume hypovolemia. This stimulates thirst centers in the brain by two separate mechanisms. Pressure sensors and arteries, baroreceptors, react to decreased blood volume and trigger thirst centers in the brain. Decreased blood flow to the kidneys will activate the renin-angiotensin system, a hormone system that regulates body fluid and blood pressure, and also stimulate thirst centers in the brain. 
Literary references to thirst during crucifixion describe a maddening agony. When Jesus said, I am thirsty, it was almost certainly as a scream. The environmental conditions were present for Jesus to develop hypothermia. Sympathetic nervous system activation caused him to be anxious, sweaty, have a rapid heart rate, and cause blood vessel constriction. He would have been cold and clammy. Jesus' clothes were taken from him at the crucifixion site, leaving him exposed to the ambient temperatures. Temperatures were cold in the early morning hours after Jesus' arrest. Peter followed the temple guard with Jesus to the palace of the high priest. He stayed some distance away but tried to monitor what was happening. Yet, it was cold enough that Peter lost his hesitation and joined the temple guard to warm himself by a fire. Average temperatures in Jerusalem during the first week of April ranges from 8 to 20 degrees Celsius, 46 to 67 degrees Fahrenheit, but can drop as low as minus 1 degree Celsius, 30 degree Fahrenheit. It was cold the day that Jesus was crucified, hanging naked on the cross in cool ambient temperatures, sweaty, and with arms and legs cold due to blood vessel constriction from the effects of blood loss, make it likely that Jesus was hypothermic. The lethal triad of causative factors for trauma-induced coagulopathy were present, namely tissue injury with blood loss, acidemia, and hypothermia. Without objective medical data, such as laboratory and hospital records, the mechanism of death cannot be known with absolute certainty, and may have differed among crucifixion victims. Suffocation as the mechanism of death with crucifixion is untenable, however. Spontaneous cardiac rupture as a cause of Jesus' death is implausible as well. Shock is the most plausible explanation for Jesus' death, Trauma-induced coagulopathy was a possible contributing factor and may have hastened his death. Forensic pathologist and medical examiner Frederick Zugaby agrees, stating that the cause of death was cardiac and respiratory arrest due to hypovolemic and traumatic shock due to crucifixion. The description of Jesus' execution written by ancient observers without medical education can be explained as consequences of traumatic hemorrhagic shock. From a medical perspective, the gospel accounts of Jesus' death appear genuine. In a somewhat macabre statement at the Last Supper, it's as if Jesus seemed to say that the mechanism of his death would be exsanguination. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I believe that Christ's suffering uh, and the demonstration of the kind of, um, of physiologic stress that his human body was under uh, is manifested in the Garden of Gethsemane where it's described that he was sweating blood. And there are there is a well-documented uh, medical condition in which patients who are under tremendous amount of uh, emotional stress and physiological stress can in fact uh, sweat blood because little blood vessels within the glands burst and, the, and then the blood is expressed. The, the, the scourge involved the use of a, a short whip with pieces of uh, typically metal, sometimes bone, sometimes pieces of porcelain wrapped in these leather straps which is then utilized to, to come across uh, typically the back, the shoulders, the legs of the victim. Uh, and uh, the first few passes across a particular body part would tear through the skin, the fat, uh, but eventually, once the outer layers were, were uh, torn away, it would start getting in the muscle and the tendon. Uh, 
And of course, along the way, you're ripping through all the blood vessels that supply all those tissues. And so you're losing blood the whole time. The plant that was described um, uh, actually had a very long thorn, um, not the little thorns that we would think from a rose bush. These were thorns that were uh, typically an inch and a half to two inches in length. The scalp is one of the most vascular portions of our body. It's got a huge blood supply up there. So then having those thorns shoved down into the, you know, down onto the bony plate would have gone through all the scalp which in and of itself would have created a huge amount of blood loss. Uh, I've seen people actually bleed to death from just a scalp injury. So uh, this is not a small injury to have, uh, who knows, dozens uh, of these things shoved into your scalp. And so that would have caused more blood loss. Typically when a victim has to uh, uh, carry the cross, what has been described uh, in the literature, in, in actual Roman literature, is they, they describe, the, they, they, they carry the crossbar. Uh, and the crossbar is estimated alone, was estimated to weigh about 110 pounds. And of course, if your arms are stuck out here, wrapped up on the cross, crossbar, and you fall down, you need help getting up. You, you, you just can't get up on your own because there's no possible way without your arms to get up. So he would have needed help getting up. If he, fall, if he fell over, there's a good chance that he could have hit his chest, which, which then could account for the possibility of a cardiac injury. Anatomically, we consider the wrists as part of the hand. And so uh, with the placement of the nails between the radius and the ulna, at that position, it, it still fits, fits the definition of being in the hand and it's in a position in which the nail won't rip out, which you have to have, you have to have a solid point of fixation. Uh, another interesting point about the placement of that is the median nerve goes right straight through that particular uh, 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 portion of the wrist. And so there would have been uh, either destruction of the nerve or, or impingement of the nerve that would have created a tremendous amount of pain so that every time you try to take a breath, you'd be, it'd be agonizing. You'd be pushing down on spiked feet which of course hurt, and then you'd be hanging on spiked arms. And so you alternate from excruciating pain to excruciating pain every time you take a breath. So, so even if he survives the actual crucifixion, he would have had to survive what I believe to be a, a, a lethal injury from the spear to, to find out whether he was alive or not. What's described is the loss of water and blood and that would entail either the, the uh, uh, either a pleural effusion or pericardial fusion, and the blood would have come from either pulmonary artery, a pulmonary vein, the aorta or vena cava, or the heart itself. None of those injuries, unless you're treated immediately by a trauma surgeon like myself, with all the advanced equipment that we have, would be survivable after even a few minutes. Christ as the Son of God could have survived anything. He chose to manifest himself as a human at that point in time and allowed himself to die. And, and being human at that point in time, he could not have survived this particular series of traumas. It's not possible. Um, Christ as God could have survived anything they threw at him. And, but he chose to be Christ the human at that point in time to die for our sins. And that, Given that, that self-limitation of remaining to be human, he died. He did not survive the event. I, uh, I'm profoundly impacted by it. Because I realized you know, the price that he paid was something I'm not... I would be, never be willing to do for probably anybody. It's very difficult for me to even to sing songs about the cross, even in worship. Because I truly do understand what he paid, the price that he paid.
death on a cross is one of the world's greatest mysteries. A brutal execution that birthed a religion. He was beaten, forced to carry a cross. The whole idea was, you know, to humiliate people and to terrify. And ultimately crucified. Jesus died within six hours, but his body was never found. His precise cause of death remains unknown to this day. How did Jesus really die? Perfected by the Romans, crucifixion is the most cruel and agonizing form of death. Often used on criminals and revolutionaries, victims are stripped and hung for all to see in the ultimate form of humiliation. Forensic pathologist Michael Hunter wants to find out exactly how Jesus died. Here are some of his most compelling theories. Theory number one, death by asphyxia. When stretched on a cross, chest muscles can tire. Breathing then becomes shallow, starving our brain of oxygen. To test this theory, three volunteers are suspended on a cross. Lee, how are you doing? Tell me, where, are you hurting anywhere? Oh yeah, where? my legs, especially in my shoulders feel like they're coming out of socket. Yeah. You, you, as long as you can, hang on there. Can you go anymore? I, I'm fine now. All right, no, just, just, I want you to go as long as you can. Doctors monitor their vital stats. So, I mean, what was it feeling like for you? Just, um, just a lot of, I mean, breathing wasn't, wasn't so bad. Yeah. But uh, just my thighs. Right. Um, this cramping, strain pain. Did you feel like you were short of breath, or was mostly just No, not the breathing. It was just the, mostly the arms. But he's not wet. You know, nasal, there's no nasal flaring. He's not having trouble getting in oxygen. He's not mouth breathing. He's, he's fine. Further tests on oxygen levels reveal that death by asphyxiation would take over six hours. But the Bible says Jesus took six hours to die on the cross. So if indeed this was the case, then you really have to think of other mechanisms. Asphyxia is pretty much off the table. Absolutely off the table here. Theory number two, dehydration from fluid and blood loss. Gospel accounts tell of Jesus sweating blood on the night before his death. Under extreme emotional stress, blood vessels around sweat glands can rupture. This is known as hematidrosis, where the skin sweats blood. This can lead to dehydration and death. But was this the main cause of Jesus' death? Theory number three, hypovolemic shock. It is a medical condition where rapid fluid loss results in multiple organ failure. The night before his crucifixion, Jesus was scourged, brutally whipped. Scourging was an integral part of the punishment of crucifixion, a public display of humiliation, a public display of the Roman imposition of their authority on a lower class criminal. Their weapon of choice was a whip known as a flagrum, made of braided leather, lead balls, and sharp carbone fragments. These whips were designed to inflict maximum pain and injury. Dr. Hunter puts the flagrum's brutality to the test on a carcass. Wow! His islands of bone just free floating. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. I mean, it's completely pulpified. So, wow. I mean, the impacts are so severe, you have uh, rib fractures, you know, anterior lateral, lateral but you also have more posterior. Oh, look at that. So, they are yeah. complete fractures. This would certainly hasten blood loss, dehydration, uh, and death. Jesus was then forced to carry his own cross to his execution. Made of oak, it was six feet long and weighed close to 40 kilograms. You have Jesus who's carrying something that's weighing 80 pounds. 
He sustained, you know, severe trauma. His heart rate is probably rising. His respiration is really rising. He's struggling. So I can imagine that he's starting to get fatigue in his, his legs. He may get somewhat disoriented, and it brings up the possibility of him uh, likely or possibly falling. According to Christian tradition, Jesus fell three times. Dr. Hunter finds out through an experiment what falling with the cross might do to the body. bounces off. Results show possible skull and rib fractures. This is the head acceleration measured by the accelerometer. And we're getting just short of 350 G. Now that is significant. Doctors believe skull fractures and concussions can occur at about 220 G. This is quite significant loading onto the chest. If you repeat this a number of times, then in fact the overall consequences could be a lot worse. His falls would have increased organ injuries caused by the scourging. I believe Jesus suffers dehydration from profuse sweating, external bleeding and lack of fluid intake. He's likely to be bleeding into his chest through fractured ribs. His internal organs may also be ruptured and bleeding. With his lungs likely partially functioning, he has difficulty in breathing and shifting blood and oxygen around his body. Once he loses 20% of his blood, he starts to go into hypovolemia. His organs, his heart, his brain will starve of blood and ultimately oxygen. Hypovolemic shock, resulting in respiratory failure and cardiac arrest, explains how Jesus would have died within six hours on the cross. Christians all know Jesus died for us on the cross, but a doctor who studied crucifixion for a decade says until you understand what Jesus went through medically, it's hard to fully appreciate just how much he suffered to pay for our sins. It was the worst form of death that was imaginable and the Romans had been using it for three centuries by the time Jesus came along, so it was well perfected. Dr. Joseph Bergeron wrote The Crucifixion of Jesus. Most often on Easter, we hear talks about how Jesus suffocated while he was on the cross. Bergeron, however, says suffocation doesn't gel with the gospel accounts of Jesus talking on the cross. When you're suffocating and struggling for your last breath, you have no interest in carrying out a conversation. The real cause of his death first shows up in Christ's own prophetic words at the Last Supper. Jesus told us how he was going to die. He said, this is my blood which is poured out for the remission of sins. That's not suffocation. That's bleeding to death. That's shock. That's the complications of shock. That would be one explanation for the odd occurrence of Jesus sweating blood in the Garden of Gethsemane. There are very few reported cases, just a handful, and they're always before severe injury, the threat of injury, and usually before execution. So that Jesus sweat drops of blood un meant that he fully understood what was about to happen to him. And then it began. The Jews and Romans bludgeoned and tore his flesh in two vicious beatings. Caiaphas and the Sanhedrin conv convicted him of blasphemy, which was punishable by death. But under Roman rule, the Jews had no authority to execute, so they physically and brutally punished him. Then a whole company of Roman soldiers beat Jesus nearly to death. They were anti-Semitic. And for this person whose charge was basically political insurrection, naming himself the king of the Jews, um, would have heightened their anger. So his beating exceeded what was typical for crucifixion victims and had extensive blood loss and tissue injury from that. So the shock set in before he reached Calvary. It looked like he was beginning to experience shock just walking there because he couldn't carry uh, part of the cross to the crucifixion site. He would have been expected to do that. Everybody else did, but he could not. Then came just about the most painful and humiliating execution the Romans could administer. It was considered obscene. A Roman citizen wouldn't even ever be crucified. It was meant for political insurgents, rank criminals, and, and escaped slaves. It all punished Jesus' body with shock so traumatic as to kill him hours sooner than most people crucified. Bergeron says shock would stop Christ's blood clotting and kill him in just six hours. 
This is a very ominous complication, difficult to control. Even in modern trauma centers in Jesus' time, there would be no treatment and it would lead to rapid death. And it explains why Jesus died so rapidly. Rapidly, but horribly, which leaves Bergeron in awe of the sacrifice. That he would become a human being and come here and do that to rectify our relationship as humans with God, to redefine it and restore us to fellowship with God. It, it's an amazing thing. And on that cross, Jesus Christ showed how simple it is to find salvation in him. It's like the thief on the cross. He didn't know what to say, so just please remember me. And a sincere prayer from anyone is never turned away. And Jesus told him that he would be in paradise that day. Bergeron realizes it's tough to face all the gory details of Christ's death, but it can make us love and respect all the more a God willing to come down to earth and face such pain and agony so people could be cleansed from their sins and spend eternity with him. The term Shroud of Turin is known to refer to a linen sheet of specific dimensions, 4 meters and 42 centimeters long by 1 meter and 13 centimeters wide. This particular sheet has been preserved in Turin since 1578. The ochre yellow cloth bears visible imprints on both its front and back surfaces, which reproduce the image of a human figure. The front image shows a face framed by long hair and a thick beard, with arms crossed over the pubis and legs extended. The back image shows the nape, the back, the legs extended, and the soles of the feet. The shroud has undergone numerous vicissitudes throughout its history, leaving behind many signs and traces. Two parallel black lines along the longer side of the shroud are indicative of burn marks caused by a fire that broke out in 1532. During the fire, the molten metal fell on the sheet and penetrated all the layers, destroying the fabric. This resulted in the symmetrical repetition of triangle-shaped holes along the black lines. The damaged sheet was repaired in 1534 by the Clarices of Chambery, who covered the holes with patches made from a linen fabric called tissue from Holland. The patches were removed in 2002 for conservation reasons, and a new supporting fabric was put in their place. In the central area of the shroud, large stains in the shape of diamonds with jagged edges are visible, caused by water that wet the fabric at some point in its history. There are also four groups of small, round burn marks, which are older than the Chambery fire. A strip of the same fabric as the shroud, 8 cm wide, was sewn along the upper edge in ancient times, with noticeable gaps at the two extreme edges. The lower edge has a gap that corresponds to the area from which two tissue samples were taken in 1973 and 1988 for scientific study. The shroud is made of fine linen, with a characteristic herringbone weave. The longitudinal strips, about one centimeter wide, are very evident when the fabric is illuminated with oblique light. On enlargement, the herringbone weave can be clearly recognized. The man on the shroud bears numerous contusive injuries that have been carefully studied by forensic doctors. <laughs> 
The right side of his face appears more swollen than the left, with visible hematomas and contused lacerations. His nasal septum is deviated due to a fracture, indicating that he was savagely beaten in the hours before his death. Numerous sinuous bloodstains can be seen on his forehead, the back of his neck, and throughout his hair, emanating from small wounds with pointed diameters. These stains radiate out from his head in a spoke-like pattern, suggesting that a helmet of sharp, pointed thorns was pressed onto his head. The characteristics of the bloodstains allow for distinguishing between injuries to arterial and venous vessels. Of particular interest is a bloodstain on the center of his forehead that flows from a wound in the frontal vein, taking on the characteristic shape of an inverted 3 as it follows the contours of his forehead. On the right side of his chest, there is a large bloodstain that flows from an oval-shaped wound caused by a pointed and sharp object that struck between the fifth and sixth ribs, penetrating deeply. The characteristics of this wound indicate that it was inflicted after the subject's death. The serum halo around the blood indicates that the blood had separated from the corpuscular portion, a common occurrence in blood that has exited a corpse. The imprints of the subject's arms on the anterior image of the shroud are clearly identifiable, with his arms outstretched and his hands crossing at the level of his pubic area. The long blood stains on both forearms that appear to run upwards are actually formed when the body was hung on the cross, and therefore the wrists were higher than the elbows. The characteristic blood stain on the left wrist formed by two divergent streaks is particularly noteworthy as it indicates two different positions assumed by the condemned on the cross, one slumped and the other raised. The absence of the image of the thumbs on the shroud is significant as it could indicate damage to the median nerve or tetanic contraction. The location of the wound on the wrist rather than in the palm of the hand, as depicted in traditional iconography of crucifixion, is also noteworthy. The ecchymoses and abrasions on the chest, back, and lower limbs consisting of round, approximately 2 cm long figures suggest injuries caused by a flagellum, a Roman torture instrument consisting of a wooden handle with cords at the end to which small metal balls were attached. The punishment was inflicted on a bent back and naked body, causing over a hundred such injuries. In conclusion, the detailed examination of the bloodstains and injuries on the subject's body provides valuable insights into the manner of his death and the torture he endured. The information gleaned from this examination can help to provide a better understanding of the historical context and cultural practices of the time. The description of the wounds on the man on the shroud continues with more details on various parts of his body. At the height of the left scapular area and the right suprascapular area, quadrangular bruises can be observed. These marks are believed to have been left by the patibulum, the horizontal beam of the cross that the condemned sometimes carried on himself to the place of execution. The object was likely heavy and rough, causing the bruises to be quadrangular in shape. Another notable feature is a transverse trickle of blood that crosses the entire back at the height of the kidneys. This blood flowed from the wound in the side and drained here when the corpse, once removed from the cross, was placed in a horizontal position. This observation provides further evidence that the man depicted on the shroud was indeed crucified. Moving to the lower limbs, both knees have abrasions that are most likely due to falls, as traces of soil have been identified in these areas as well as on the soles of the feet. The left knee was fixed in a more flexed position than the right due to cadaveric rigidity, resulting in the left limb appearing shorter in the image. The sole of the right foot is clearly imprinted, while only the posterior part near the heel is visible on the left foot. This suggests that crucifixion was carried out using a single nail and overlapping the left foot on the right foot. On the sole of the right foot, a nail exit hole can be seen from which rivulets of blood flow down towards the toes. By transforming the image of the shroud into its photographic negative, the brightness is obviously inverted, and the true appearance of the man on the shroud appears as if he were in front of us. This finding has helped to enhance the details and features of the man's body, providing more insight into his physical characteristics and the wounds he suffered.
Someone.